done. Um, so thank you very much, um, and uh, okay, I'm to come and present. Um, so uh, it's going to be a little bit of a whistle stop tour of an exhibition which ran at the British Museum um, between 2015 and 2016. I was open there for four months. Um, and this was a collaborative exhibition which was organised in partnership with National Museums of Scotland. Um, but I'm going to be talking quite specifically about the British Museum exhibition um, because um, the specific pieces of research that we undertook um, in terms of the like pre-display um, evaluation and the summary evaluation at the end relate specifically to the British Museum show. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit of a whistle stop, as I say, but I'm, what I'm going to go through are um, our goals in putting on the exhibition um, and talk a little bit about these focus groups that we did to think about what um, prospective visitors already know and what they wanted or expected to see in the exhibition or what they told us they wanted um, I'm very briefly going to say what we actually did in the exhibition, though I'd be very happy to discuss that um, more if people want later. Um, and then I'm going to look at the summative evaluation that we did, so who actually came to the exhibition, um, and try and think about whether it worked, what do people think, you know, what worked well and what didn't, um, and just a few thoughts for um, the future, like what lessons would I take if we were going to do it again. So our goals, including on um, the exhibition, um, primarily, and I've had to really kind of, um, sort of perhaps oversimplify this, there were many, many goals to put on the show, um, but a big reason why we were able to have this opportunity to put on a big blockbuster exhibition um, on the Celts at the British Museum was because our director, Neil McGregor, um, wanted to explore ideas of kind of British national identity um, and specifically to bring some of this, um, sort of, I'm calling it new, but um, academic research from the kind of 1990s and onwards. Um, to um, a museum audience and tell that story through objects. Um, and I'm sure probably everyone here will be familiar with what I'm saying about the new academic ideas about the Celts, um, but very, very briefly, um, really the idea that um, this sort of traditional map showing kind of Celtic migrations into Britain um, might in fact not be the best way to think about um, kind of you know, population dynamics and um, how people lived in their connections in the Iron Age period. Um, and instead, and what we wanted to present in the exhibition was the fact that there is kind of clear um, historical um, air between um, the areas where the classical authors spoke about the ancient Celts as living um, from around about 500 BC through into the early Roman period, uh, and the areas which today have become the modern Celtic nations, and explore the way that that name has kind of been reappropriated from the sort of 16, 1700s onwards. Um, to refer to something um, which is an equally valid identity but is quite different to the prehistoric identity. Um, so this is just to give you a, um, a sense of the remit that we had. Um, and I see my um, co-curators over there who know as well as well. Um, but, um, so the British Museum, the remit was this was going to be a blockbuster exhibition in the exhibition space in the um, Sainsbury's Exhibition Gallery. Um, and you can see it here with a Viking boat in it. Uh, so it is a really colossal space. Um, and the remit was that we had to create a show which spanned from 500 BC to present, pretty much. Um, and I'm not going to go into this in detail, but within that framework, we didn't have complete carte blanche to do whatever we wanted because there are some quite specific requirements um, about kind of how style in terms of putting on a VN exhibition and think about the number of sections you can have, objects and enders, you know, which is partly connected to um, sort of budget requirements and things as well. Um, and with quite specific ideas in terms of the number of sort of stops, so like text stops that people have, um, and the total number of words and the sort of tone and style of those labels and interpretation. So we did these focus groups um, with a group called um, TW Research, and then three focus groups for us, and people were able to send in some um, sort of um, pre-group uh, um, sort of information, <coughs> sort of first responses about who they thought the Celts were, and they were able to kind of use the internet for this. Um, and, and then they came in, and these were people who were mostly based in London because we held the focus groups in London, um, and they were all um, museum goers um, between the ages of about 20 and 40. Um, so, this is um, a spontaneous kind of open <laughs> response um, when people are asked, um, and this is this is they are at home, at their computer, they have the internet available to them. <laughs> and this is the response when they were asked what they thought of um, when they heard Celts. 
Um, the majority responded that they didn't know. Um, you will notice that um, Scandinavian is as big as um, Scottish and typically an Irish, like Game of Thrones, um, the Druid's ancient tribe. So I just, you know, and someone said in the um, exhibition, oh, sorry, in one of the focus groups, um, and uh, this was reported in much more um, sort of muted tones by the, uh, the actual research group people. And um, what the guy said when we were talking to him about it and what he thought about us putting on a Celts exhibition at the British Museum was, Celts, man, they ain't got no brand. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting um, for us. So I'm, I'm going to go back to this. But I think this is quite different to the, um, the ideas which we set out to kind of, you know, counter these kind of myths and things. So what people came up with, so when they're at home, they use Google Image. Um, they, these are the images they suggested, um, there's some quotes there. So actually the top one is the best. I, I tried to sort of span them. So this is the, I think, the quote that showed the most sort of knowledge and understanding. I think the Gauls might have been Celts, so I think Asterix. I think of them fighting the Romans. Um, I think they did a lot of intricate jewellery. Um, Irish tourist hat is all done in the same <laughs> time. These, and, uh, these are all like direct quotes um, from our respondents. So, you know, I apologise for any um, uh, offences, but I'm trying to present to you what we actually were, were told. Um, and compared to the thing about Game Thrones and then Big Warriors. Um, and really, generally, the responses reflected a very, very kind of, you know, warlike stereotype. Um, most people, and I think this is telling because we were doing it in London rather than, you know, for example, if we'd done the same um, assessment in Scotland, I think we would have got very different answers. Um, but, uh, but mainly people were thinking of the council being associated with ancient Britain, but they actually had very little chronological sense. If you ask people about dates, um, there wasn't a lot um, to draw on. Um, and nobody mentioned this kind of, you know, Celtic expansion, Celtic migration. Um, so what did they want or expect to see? Um, they um, predominantly expected to see weapons and round huts. Um, but I think this, the, the size of weapons there, like, there is this very warlike stereotype that these people had um, uh, come back with. And one of the things, so the point where I actually got to speak in the um, uh, focus groups, we then were able at the end to kind of show them some of the kind of objects we would be displaying. Um, and uh, we had some really, really lovely responses to that. And people were really fascinated by the idea that these people who they thought of as being very kind of warlike were actually producing this incredibly ornate kind of jewellery and weaponry. Um, and we had somebody say, I just didn't think there'd be any art from that era. I just saw that era as being war and savagery and I didn't imagine any art conversion from it. So this and the kind of, you know, the, the mystery and the discovery um, which Liz was talking about were really, really kind of key that, that those are some of the things that people were very interested in. Um, so I'm really going to only talk very, very briefly about the actual exhibition because I've only got 15 minutes and I could spend far more than that talking about the whole exhibition. Um, but we opened with, um, so when you first went in, you were faced with these three objects, um, a Scottish harp, glass app, um, a Welsh bag from the Eisteddfod, which is quite a modern piece, um, and a stone cross, which is only medieval. And although you won't be able to read them, this is what it says um, about it. So we were going... Um, straight in and just around the corner um, you would see those two maps that I showed you at the beginning of the areas where the ancient Celts were described as living and the modern Celtic nations um, and we were very much kind of following that story all the way through. Um, so this is, um, we tried in the design exhibition, it's one of the things that I think worked really well, um, but to draw on that kind of you know, Celtic art um, designs in it um, and so um, we had people just kind of arriving here, this obviously a model in the exhibition that they made um, for us. And as they came through, um, people first, so they had this introductory section which we've seen an image of, where we kind of tried to sort of situate it, explain that we were telling this sort of two and a half thousand year story, um, and that the, we were not talking about a single people through time, but the ways which a sort of name had been um, changed and how it was used. Um, we started then with the Iron Age section here, which was the largest section of the exhibition, where we dealt with the kind of ancient Celts. Um, we looked at what happened with the arrival of the Romans in a much smaller area, um, and then we went on to talk about the emergence oh, I'm back, I'm sorry, um, of distinctive identities um, in the Wales, Scotland, Ireland, um, and particularly Scotland because of the connection with National Museum of Scotland, um, in the early medieval section, and then we looked at how the name Celts got applied to 
Cliffs um, in the Celtic Revival section, um, which follows um, the last part of the, the exhibition there. Um, so, who actually came to the exhibition? Um, this is based on an assessment done by all the BM's own visitor number counts, um, an assessment um, done by Morris Hargreaves and McIntyre. Um, so we had 162,000 um, visitors in total, um, which um, was really good. And um, the average dwell time, we were told to aim for 90 minutes, we've got 83 minutes, that's quite standard. Um, and uh, that's all I'll say about that, but that's roughly how many people want to spend standing up in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, something which was really interesting, so I'm only going to talk about the ways in which the visitor demographic to Celt was kind of different to the normal British Museum page for exhibition demographic, which tends to be an older, often London-based demographic. Um, but something that I did find interesting was that sort of emotional drivers visiting the exhibition were much higher for Celts than they were for our earlier Vikings exhibition, which was really primarily intellectual. And we did have a sense um, that some of the people who were coming, this is a quote from a, a visitor, um, that that was what they felt they got from the exhibition. Um, and more visitors, um, so it's fairly typical that most of the UK residents, um, because often our international visitors just go to the free parts of the museum. Um, but 55% from outside London, which is unusually high, um, and 8% of our visitors to find us white Irish, which is again unusually high for a BM pay for exhibition. Um, and, but most of our visitors, and it shouldn't really be a surprise to any of us, but I say it anyway, um, came saying they had a general level of knowledge, and many actually described themselves as having little or no knowledge about the house of the history. Um, so, did it work? What did people think? Um, broadly speaking, whilst like any major exhibition, you know, you do get complaints and things, most of the complaints are about things like overcrowding, um, the pervasive music, which I will tell you about over a beer if you like later. Um, <laughs> but the, um, the majority of comments um, on the sort of narrative and interpretation, which I think is perhaps of more interest to us here, um, were actually very positive. Um, and um, so 85% of this is satisfied with the amount of information, 81% with the theme storyline. Um, that's obviously not as high as it could be, but that's fairly standard for when we do these um, uh, sort of polls. Um, and these are just some quotes from um, visitors. Uh, I mostly got to see the more positive quotes, so, but you know, that's reflected in that. Um, and we had um, a very nice view, um, review by um, Manuel Fernandez Goods in Antiquity as well. So there were lots of things about it that went um, really well, um, but I wanted to um, take a minute to think about what could we have done differently, what maybe we could have done better. And one of the things that when putting this together, and I, you know, I want to discuss this because I thought about this kind of for the first time when putting this together. But um, so well, this is just um, an absolute true. But you know, the British Museum. We, we only had the opportunity to curate this kind of blockbuster prehistory exhibition because there's a certain amount of name recognition for Celts, despite our Celts man, they ain't got no brand. Um, by the way. Um, and we wouldn't have had that opportunity if it wasn't for that kind of hook. So even if we think there are kind of these sort of myths around the idea of the Celts, um, you know, that's a sort of um, a double-edged sword there for us because the hook is what gets people interested and what gets people in. So we have to think very carefully about how we balance that. Um, but actually, one of the things I thought when going through this and I'm really thinking about it for the purposes of putting this together, was that a lot of people, the, the myths that we thought we were setting out to dispel, nobody in our focus group actually came <laughs> with those myths, right, in their head. So, you know, there's a, there's a question about like who this exhibition was really for. I mean, I, mean, I got you know, really nice feedback from um, lots of academics who came to see the exhibition, and I don't think I would actually have had the guts to do it any differently, but I do think that the way that we did it, with people coming straight in and us being like, so, this is actually quite complicated, um, and, you know, saying some of these things you think of as Celtic, maybe they aren't, what are we going to do? Um, you know, actually maybe that wasn't the stereotype that most people were coming in with directly. Most people were coming in with a stereotype of warlike barbarians. Um, and the only comment that I got repeatedly, and I say repeatedly, there were maybe like three or four, because the um, comments that made their way to the curator were the ones that asked a question about content. Um, and the only kind of repeated comment that I got 
about what people wish they'd seen but hadn't was that they wanted to see more about daily life, more about how people actually lived, and that they'd come to an exhibition called Celts, and they wanted to hear about these ancient, mysterious people called, um, called Celts. And so my final kind of thought is just, so this is one of the headlines, from Monsters to Mango, Golden Age of Art by the Celtic Race That Never Was, headlined by May Kennedy and The Guardian when we launched um, the exhibition. So she hadn't been to see the exhibition at this point, it was after the press launch. And I just feel like, have we made this too complicated? <laughs> like, that headline does not make me want to go to an exhibition. And, um, it, you know, it, I just, um, you know, wanted to kind of sort of start a discussion about um, how do we deal with it when we have this double-edged sword, which is both a real positive and a negative, where we think we have this kind of hook that we do have some name recognition and we can get people in, but actually it, there's a danger that in trying to dispel those myths, and I know we talked about that from day one of creating the exhibition, that you actually um, kind of add to them. But I think a real challenge has got to be maybe rather than um, <coughs> deconstructing myths, which people may or may not have in mind, that we actually need to kind of just tell better stories, and maybe that's the way that, that we can do it. Um, so thanks very much. Thank <laughs> you.